Take your Bibles, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. Thank you, Sister Pam, Brother Matthew, Brother Turkey Leg for helping us play them songs. Let me ask you a question this morning, and, and, and if you want to raise your hand and say something, you more than you're more than welcome to. I could just go around the room and and ask you this question. What are you most what are you most afraid of? Everybody's got a fear of some kind, of something. What are you most afraid of? Anybody want to tell me? Yeah. Mice and what? Roller coasters. I don't blame you. I'm just scared of where things go. I might take that wrong step and go back. Listen to that. The man's been dry 20 some odd? 31. 31 years. I don't mean short changes. 31 years. But I, I know him. He's scared that on the worst day, on his worst day, the devil's going to pop up with a pint and say, here you go, this will make it better. And he's afraid he'll do it. He's afraid he'll do it. Somebody else. That's a legitimate fear, by the way. Yes, Rose. I'm scared that I will die and my family will not be saved. Yep. Same thing. They'll wish they had one of these days. Yes. Something happening to my kids. Something happening to my kids. Something happening to your kids. Yeah, I got that. Jr. Being taken out of the way. Being taken out of the way. Yes, sir. I understand that. Yes, ma'am. Scared of God. That's good. Who else? How come nobody on this side scared of anything? Well, you got all the scaredy cats over here? I, uh, we read the Bible a lot. You know, mm -hmm. uh, things that God did, which, man, I've lived with myself for a long boy. I, I don't want to go to hell. The things that God did when he's, when he's mad, like the ground opening up and swallowing 250 people and then closing back. A fear of going to hell. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, Sister Betty. Same one. Fear of going to hell. And oh, I'm with you. Aren't you glad this is not East Tennessee? We don't handle snakes in our church. Amen. Yes, Liam. Bees. I am too. I don't like them. Oh, yeah. When Matthew was little, I always tell you, you know, we'd see wasps around, and I'd say, now, Matthew, just stay away from them. They won't bother you if you don't mess with them. Well, we was outside one time, and he went under the porch to get a ball or something like that, and I mean, they hit him about four times on the back, and he'd come out mad. I didn't mess with them! <laughs> he was furious! <laughs> David. Family, my role is spiritual head by family. Yes, sir. Yes, Chris. I'm just worried that the way things are going in this country, it's a lot like Nazi Germany started, and it's kind of happening here. I'm not sure I can see it happening. There is, it is a legitimate fear that I think probably most, if not all of us have, that we're going to lose the freedoms, the liberties that we have, and they will turn against us. If you, one of the reasons I study World War II, is I want to I want to get in the mindset, number one, of the German people and the Japanese people, why they would blindly follow their such cruel intentions. 
In Japan, it, they didn't see it so much. Everybody in Japan is Japanese, and they revere their own kind. Anybody who's not Japanese is of lower value to them, and there are not too many foreigners in Japan. To this day, they don't let people in. They just don't let too many people come and stay in their country. They're Japanese only, and they keep it that way. But here you've got Germany. Here you have German citizens who pay taxes, who immediately, their banks, their properties, their livelihoods were confiscated by the German government. They were declassified as citizens. And the next thing you know, they're being rounded up and put on rail cars, spending four days in a rail car with no food, no water, only be taken off the rail car and put right into a gas chamber. The soldiers and the people of Germany went along with that willingly. And any of them who say, well, we didn't know what was going on, most, for the most part, that's not true. They were told to do this, and they did it. They followed that blindly. And I am, I am serious to say that we are in a country right now that does not see the Christian in this country as a moral benefit they see us as being in their way to stop them from sinning as much as they want to. And that's how it is. So I'm, I'm right there with you. There's a lot of things that, that I fear. Things that I get afraid of. And as I've told you many times before, the older I get, the more fear I get in me. And some days, I'm just, I am no good. I am absolutely no good. I can't, I can't do my work. I can't, I can't do much of anything. I am just bound by fear. The devil, I'm sorry to say, but the devil has stuff on me. Like he does on you. He was there. When you did stuff. You don't want anybody else to know. He talked you into it. One of the tools. That he has. Against us. Is binding us. In that fear. That our past. Will catch up to us. You know. they When they captured. Adolf Eichmann. He was one of the he was one of the ringleaders of killing the Jews that actually got away. He changed his name and then he snuck out of the country, ended up in Argentina with his wife and his children. Changed his name to Roberto Clemente. Went to work in a factory. And he hid out down there, and it wasn't until somewhere around, I'm going to say right around 1960, that the Jews got wind that he was over there, and they sent Mossad agents over there to capture him and bring him back. But that man spent every day of his life looking behind his shoulder to see who was following him. Every day of his life, he was scared to death that they were going to capture him. And he knew. You gotta, you gotta follow the story. You gotta go read this story. He knew that when this guy passed him on the road that night, that the man wasn't Argentinian. He knew something was up because as soon as he turned around and he saw that guy, he started screaming to the top of his lungs. And that Mossad spy grabbed him and put his hand over his mouth. That Jewish spy put a glove on because he said, "I don't want his mouth touching my hand." Because he killed, Adolf Eichmann killed that man's whole family in a pit. Just had soldiers just shoot them down in a pit, baby and all. And he said, I don't want to touch his mouth. And that took him and they finally, they, he hung for his crimes. But he spent every day running from his past. Ephesians chapter 6, here's why I'm saying this. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
devils, I am probably more afraid of devils than I am anything. People have asked me over the years, well, Pastor, aren't you worried that the Illuminati is going to catch up with you? No. Some, I'll get people on the phone, I'll have them try to tell me you know, what it is they, that they think, and they say, well, I don't want to say it over the phone, they're listening. I don't care. I, I said, I'm out seven times a week on the internet. I'm pretty sure everything I think is out there. They already know. I said, I'm not worried about that. What I'm scared most of are devils. I've experienced them firsthand. Having them filled me with so much fear and terror that twice now, being in Kenya, I tried to get out of there as fast as I could. Twice, going to Kenya, twice. Michael will tell you that I, I couldn't stand it. I wanted to leave that place and get home and get away from there. They would not stop terrorizing me. They wouldn't stop. So it's not, it's not men that I worry about. I'm not really worried about dying. I'm scared it'll hurt. That's what I'm scared of. Wherefore, taking you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, and I'm going to preach the second part of this, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. If you remember... Last Sunday, I put up a list of some of the fiery darts that the devil uses against us. False belief, false doctrine, doubt. Doubt about our salvation. If you've ever worried that maybe you're not really saved, let me tell you, you're normal. You're normal. Only an arrogant fool would say, I never worry about my salvation. That guy's a fool. That guy's just being cocky and mouthy as far as I'm concerned. Because I think doubt comes with it. Fear, lust, pride, covetousness, jealousy, lying signs and wonders, false miracles, gifts. These are the fiery darts that the devil sends out after us. But I'm going to concentrate this morning on fear. Fear that you're not going to heaven. Fear that you're not good enough. To qualify for God's blessings. A lot of people think that way. Fear that you may die or fear that you may not die. Those of us who had COVID and who had it pretty bad. I think a lot of us agreed that there comes a time during the course of that illness. That you become legitimately afraid that you're going to die from it. I know what happened to me because every day that went by, I got sicker and sicker and I got to a point to where I thought I'm not going to make it. And then a few days after that, I got to the point where I said, now I'm afraid I'm going to live. Oh no, because it kept going on and on. It wasn't like. Other sicknesses I've had where after two or three days you start feeling a little bit better. This went for weeks. And I'd wake up the next morning. Still same bad cardboard taste in my mouth. Still that smell in my nose. The other day I got a whiff of that. Just out of the blue and I went, oh no. But afraid. Being in fear. When I'm being electrocuted under my house, I was afraid. I, I was afraid. I was not in pain. Because I had told myself, Mike, you're fixing to go stand before God. And I got afraid. 
Because now I'm fixing to go stand before my creator who knows everything I've ever done. And the last prayer that I thought I was going to pray in this world was, God, please have mercy on me. Why? Because I'm like you, John. I don't want to go to hell. That scares me. That scares me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help you this morning with fears. We, are, we, are, we were placed into a weakened, lowly form for a reason. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you, God, and there's several, there's a lot of things, Lord, in this world that I'm just not afraid of. I don't sit and worry about it the way others do. I, I guess I understand it, but some things that are going on in this world, some things that are happening, some things that have had happened, I'm just not too worried about. But Father, there is, there's enough things in this life that I legitimately fear. That I, and I realize, God, that I have no control over it whatsoever. And I realize and understand what that fear is all about. That fear is there to try to get me to stop serving you. Father, the times when I almost quit was because I was afraid. And I pray, dear God, that you would help each and every one of us in the things that we're afraid of, the things that we worry about, the things that we fear. I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would show us from your word that, number one, you understand our fear. You're not disappointed at us for being afraid. It's not a sin to be afraid. If that was the case, none of us, none of us could ever make it into heaven. Even David admitted to you that he was afraid. So Father, I pray dear God that each and every one would take your word this morning your Holy Ghost would apply it in the areas of our life, Father, that we fear the most, the things that we are worried about, the things that we have the most care over. And God, would you remind us and show us that you are, in fact, still a good God to your people. And that you'll be there for them no matter what. So, Father, I ask, dear God, that you just help us, Father. Fill our hearts and our minds with your spirit and with your word. And show us, Father, that when it comes to you and your ability to save us, that we can put our trust in you. That we can lean on you. Because, Father, you'll take everything else away so that we don't have a choice. And, Father, then help us to help others who fear. Help us to help others who are afraid because we ourselves were and to give them that same comfort that we were comforted with. I ask your blessings on the word. Help me to preach it this morning. We pray in Jesus name and all of God's people said. Turn to Matthew chapter 14. While you're turning there, I remember there was a man, a young man that I grew up with here in this church. I liked him. We'd always done a couple things in church together. I remember we went out door knocking one time on a Saturday, just driving around inviting people to church. His mom and dad were members here. And we, um, after they moved, they, we kind of parted company. And for years, I didn't know where he was. I didn't know what he was doing or anything like that. But one day, the Lord laid it on my heart to go see him. I didn't even know he was in town. And I, I went and asked Rose. I said, Rose, you know where so-and-so lives? And she said, yeah. She told me. And I said, you mean he's here in town? She said, yeah. So I remember I took Brother Sterling over to his house. I've told part of this story before, but... 
We visited for a while and I could just tell the devil had his grips on him. I mentioned before, but he was carving into wood. He had would picked up a knife and was just carving into this piece of wood. And he said, I got talents I didn't know I had. And he was wood carving. And he showed me this piece of wood, this flat wood, and he had carved this eerie, ghostly image into this board. And he said, I keep seeing this. When I close my eyes, I keep seeing it. And I said, I can carve it out. I mean, it had just long robes that look like bat wings on it and everything like that. But he mentioned, he said, I can't see the face. I'd carved the face, but I can't see it. And I mean, the Holy Ghost got me and said, Mike, tell him this. And I said, you don't want to see the face. And he looked at me funny. I said, this is the spirit that's got you in bondage. To me, that's clear. I said, thou should not make unto thee. And he finished it. Any graven images. And I said, look what you're doing. He knew the Bible. He grew up in church. I said, look what you're doing. This is the spirit that has you in its grip and will not let you go. And I sat with him in his house for two hours. And I gave him every verse of scripture. I tried every way in the world I, to talk to him, to get him back in church, get him right with God. And you know what he said? Mike, I'm afraid. I said, what are you afraid of? He said, I've been in church, out of church, in church, out of church so often. And he said, I get in there and get serving for a while. The devil grabbed me and start pulling me back with old things and the old life. And he said, I've done it so many times. He said, I'm afraid to go back again. Because I don't think I'll be able to do it. I'll be right back out again. And he had to get up and run to the restroom real quick. And I said, God, get me something to say to him that'll, that'll hit him. That, that he won't be able to argue with. Because he had argued with everything I said. And when he came back and sat down, I said something to him, and I mean, it hit him. And he said, he stopped, right, just like this. And he said, oh, wow. I have nothing to say against that. And I said, well, I want you to come to church Sunday. Well, he, that was a Thursday. He called me Saturday. And he said, I'll be there tomorrow. He said, God's already got a hold of me. And he said, I've been on my face crying before God. He said, I've asked God to forgive me of all my sins. And I told God, God, I can't live this life. I can't do it. You'll have to do it in me and you'll have to do it for me. And he came that next day and came down to this altar. and We prayed for him. Went out and cut that big long ponytail he had off. Just cut it off. Now I'm going, yeah, that's God. I mean, God just got all over him. One of the devil's greatest tools against us is fear. Somebody mentioned fear of the past. Fear that the devil will bring back into your life some of your old buddies. Your buddies that you used to drink with, smoke with, do drugs with, chase women with, or chase guys, whatever your thing is. Your fear is that they will come back into your life and you have no power against that. You, that's why you stayed away from them. But the devil just pulls them out, out of a hat and pulls them back into your life. And as soon as he does, you just seem to fall right back into that old stuff again. And you've got no power against it. Somebody got in touch with us here not too long ago asking a question about certain lifestyles. And it happens to be a lifestyle that they're living in right now. Wanting to know if it was wrong. They know what's wrong. They know it's wrong. And every day that they're living in that lifestyle, there is always a certain amount of fear. What if Jesus came back today, found me living like this? What if I died today? What if I was in a car wreck today? Do you know how easy it is for a person to be killed in this world right now? I'm teaching Caleb how to drive. And I said, Caleb, it's not you you have to worry about. Or maybe sometimes it is you. 
It's these other people, these other idiots that don't know how to drive. Them you got to watch out for because they can take you out in a heartbeat. And I would say to anybody today that you don't know where you stand with God. You don't know if you're living for God or not. You don't know if your sins have been forgiven. It's been a long time since you talked to God. It's been a long time since you confessed anything. It's been a long time since you read your Bible or visited with God in your private prayer closet. And you're afraid that your lifestyle right now is going to catch up with you and God's going to come and get you. If you're that way, you do should, you should be afraid. I never forget September 11th, 2001. Young lady called me and was talking about, is this the end of the world? And I said, no, it's not the end of the world. But I said, I'm going to preach on it tomorrow night. And she's, well, I'm afraid. I said, you should be afraid. Well, I mean, I was bold. I said, you should be afraid. You need to get right with the Lord. The facing of God's judgment brings fear or should bring fear to a person's life. You are going to stand before God in judgment one of these days. And He's either going to accept you or reject you. And it will not be on the basis of the good things you've done. It will be on whether or not the blood has washed away your sins. Somebody say amen. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you afraid of dying? When I went up to visit Brother Sterling that day in the, in the hospital, he was not afraid to die. He just didn't know what course to take, didn't know what to do. He was afraid that maybe God was done with him here. And I said, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know that, but I don't think so. Obviously, God's not done with him. Amen? Or he'd be gone out of here. But fear is the number one devil's tool. People who are afraid to lose their life. You know, think about, I talk about World War II all the time. There were people in France that when Germany took over, they immediately, these French people, immediately sided with the German soldiers. Do you know why? They were afraid to die. Let me remind you something. You're going to anyway. Everybody in this room, everybody hearing my voice, you are going to die one of these days. And I'll tell you what, I watched a film a guy took when the Allies went marching into Paris. Those French people in Paris started dragging people out of buildings and taking them down in the street and beating them to death because they had parted and sided with the Germans then. And they pulled them out and they killed them in the streets. They said, you were afraid to die? Well, you're dying today for siding with the Bosch. They killed them that day because they said, you turned against your own people. How dare you do that? Well, I was afraid to die. Chris, you mentioned this country. And you know what? The sad part of it is we've got a lot of people in this country that would be afraid to die. So they'll just let things go and let the crazy corrupt politicians steal everything out of our country. Under threat that, well, I, I, I might lose everything. Something might happen to me if I, if I go against it. I'd be afraid to live in a country under those people. Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, 25. Open your Bible up to that. One of the questions I want to ask you is, do you know where you're going when you die? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are going to heaven when you die? If you are simply religious, then you have no knowledge that you're going to die and go to heaven. If you're simply religious. Religion does not confirm in you only what God can confirm in you. That you are His child, His people, and that eternal life is your home in heaven with God forever. But if you're simply religious, you will never have that knowledge in your heart. You'll be somebody that is afraid to die. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Can you imagine that? A man walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying what? It is a spirit. 
They thought it was a ghost. And as I mentioned before, that scares me. Haints, spirits, ghosts, devils, they scare me. That first time I went to Kenya, I had them all over me. And they had me so scared, Sterling, and so much in fright, laying in that bed, I kept hearing them saying, get out, get out, you don't belong here, you're in danger, get out. And I listened to that for hours laying in that bed that night. And I almost got up in panic and grabbed my wife and said, we got to get to the airport. I almost did. Then a couple years later, we're out in, um, what was that, Maguri? First night out there, Michael, get me on a plane out of here. Get me on a plane. Michael, find a plane, get me out of here. i got to get back home. And Michael was looking up flights. And finally, somebody said something. One of the preachers said something. And immediately I went, oh, I know what this is. But I had devils who were growling at me, telling me not to preach out there. And it almost worked. I found something out this week. And I'm going to show you here in a minute. When the disciples saw him walk on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus said unto them, or spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. What are you, crazy, Jesus? Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. That would be so neat. But when he saw the wind boisterous, what happened? He was afraid. Now, why would a fisherman not know how to swim? Right? If you're going to fish in a boat, Learn how to swim. But he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the shield of what? Faith. Faith. It's one thing to start out in faith. That's what got Peter out of the boat. But we're talking about not just starting in faith. We're talking about continuing in faith. If Peter had not been afraid and had he not doubted, he would have made it all the way over to Jesus and wouldn't have had a problem, would he? But he saw the wind. He got afraid. And as he got afraid, he began to sink. And he cries out, Jesus, save me! And did Jesus laugh? Did he say, I ain't saving you. Save yourself. He stuck his hand out, reached in, pulled him out of the water. So, oh, Peter. Oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Had he just kept believing. This would one be one of those things where I'd have to close my eyes and walk. Amen? And does not God teach us to do that anyway? For we walk by faith and not by... Sometimes, and you listen to this, sometimes you need to shut your eyes to what's going on in this world and just think, God's still good, God's still saving me, God's going to hold on to me, and I will not worry about what's going on. Chris, I'll tell you what I did. And I mean it. I went down to Pea Ridge, Arkansas, and I preached this. And I've come back, and very seldom now, very seldom, I won't say I never do it, very seldom do I turn the news on and watch it. I did turn something on just long enough to watch Joe Biden fall down the steps three times. 
That was worth it. There's a video on now. I think Jim sent it to me. It's of Trump throwing Trump hats and they're hitting Biden. It's, that's what's knocking him down. And I'm going, that's pretty good. I quit going to the news websites. I quit watching the news. So, well, you don't know what's going on in the world. I do too. I know exactly what's going on in the world. I quit watching that stuff because it was filling my heart full of fear. And you know what it had me wanting? Well, maybe we just ought to let them just take over the country. I don't want that. I either want Trump or somebody way better than him to run the next time and beat these guys. And put this country back where it belongs on the right track. That's what I really want. But you see this stuff about all oh, the FBI is looking for people who are who are favoring Trump or the FBI is looking for all these people that that, you know, are right wing extremists. And the, they're going to make a database of all the guns and they're going to come after them and they're, they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And that stuff just I'm just getting scared of that stuff. So it's best for me. I just shut it off. And I'd rather walk blind and ignorant in this, in this world and believe what God said than to have my mind full of fear every single day because of that junk. I'm telling you, the devil's greatest tool is this and it's going to, it is going to be this. After, let's say at some point, they do start persecuting conservatives. Right wings, fundamentalists, Bible believers, arresting them, shutting down their churches, shooting them. That'll send a message to the rest of the country saying, you don't want to be like them, do you? And that'll work. Because I guarantee you, most people will seek to preserve their own life here in this world. Not realizing that they are still going to die. Only now they're going to die in bondage. And not die as free men. And the devil will use that on you to scare you and say... Oh, we're going to take away everything you have and you're going to lose everything and we're going to kill all your family. Who mentioned they're afraid of losing their family? That's me. And I'll tell you, Pam, what God did for me one day. Turn to Mark chapter 4. The day after my granddaughter died. The day before her funeral. I was in a very, very sullen, very angry, bitter mood. And I came home, I went down in the woods, took an axe, and just started taking this out on a tree. And I'm not going to say everything that happened during that time down there, but by the time I was done, I was telling God, God, you can have her. And every member of my family, so long as you keep them in your bosom. And I meant it. If the devil, devil knows that he could use my children and my grandchildren to get to me. He knows it. So God had me down there in that woods. So that I would realize and recognize that God had my granddaughter. And I don't, the rest of you kids, I'm just telling you, I turned you over to God one day. So he may take you all out one day. That's just saying. But if he does, you're going to be with him. And the devil can't touch you no more. And that would be okay with me.
because I don't want to lose my family either. And if they all go to heaven, I won't. Matthew, Mark chapter 4, verse 30, 37, are you there? There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. I want you to understand, waves. In a storm, there's not just one big wave. They just keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they never seem to never stop. It's one wave after another. Now, I want you to pay attention to that word, wave. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the, in the hinder part of the ship. Christ was asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, the, and Reg Kelly said, this is the stupidest question in the whole Bible. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Of course he does. He's the one that came from heaven, came down here to the earth to die on a cross, to be beaten, to be scourged, to be, I, listen, I did a, I did a thing this week on crucifixion. Do you know what it, you know how it kills people? It strangles them. You know how long it takes? Hours! Christ agonized on the cross, struggling to breathe. For hours he did that. And he did it for who? Us! Of course he cares whether or not we perish. Somebody say amen. Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now let me say something. All of these, all of these doomsday conspiracy websites on the internet. Ten years ago, they predicted that we would be under martial law within a year. They'd be confiscating all our guns. We would be a communist dictatorship here in America and it'd be all over with. It didn't happen. Didn't happen. 2012, they said, whole world's going to end. 2012. Didn't happen. All the banks are going to fail. Banks are going to fail any day. Didn't happen. All oh, this disease. Oh, it's terrible. It's going to kill all this. Didn't happen. And I'm getting about sick and tired of reading the doomsday liars who are trying to tell everybody every day, oh, this is bad, oh, it's terrible, oh, this is all this going on, we need to do this, we need to do that. I about had it, reading that junk. I could do much better reading this so that I'm not afraid anymore. I already know how it's all going to turn out. And I'm like, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Bring it on. Because the sooner it all goes south, the sooner he's coming back. Carest thou not that we perish? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You have no faith because you have shut the source of faith out of your life. You've shut it out. And the devil has got you scared to death. Literally of everything. When you could say, you know what? I hope it does happen tomorrow. Praise the Lord! He's coming back! Amen! I didn't get no amens on that. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me tell you what I learned this week. And I believe this. In all my studies, I have determined that I would say most, if not practically all devils, are beasts. And I could point you places in the Bible and show you that. And I've, I found out something I, that I remembered from when I was a boy in, in, in school. I'd learned this in school. That certain low tones can induce fear 
in an animal or a person. Tones that we cannot hear with our ears, yet if they are emitted, they all of a sudden just strike terror in us. My wife knows, I've told her, I've told some of you. I'd just be sitting, minding my own business, just nothing, and all of a sudden, fear wells up in me. And I mean, terror. And I'm going, where is this coming from? I mean, I'm, I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't like thinking of something or something like, and it just all of a sudden, I mean, I'm just sick with terror, fear. Then that turns to anxiety. Anybody ever had an anxiety attack? Those are not fun. Because you literally flip out of your head thinking you're going to die at any moment. I've had them. And I'm just going, where is that coming from? At least it'd say, what's going on? Nothing. Well, what are you afraid of? I don't know. But then your mind starts thinking up stuff to be afraid of. And you're afraid of this and you're afraid of that. that and it's stuff that is in the future. You, and how, how many of you can tell the future? You know what the future is going to happen. You know what's going to happen five minutes from now. None of us. None of us. But here's what I think. Researchers have determined certain, certain low powerful frequencies can induce in an animal or a human intense fear and terror. The low growl of the tiger. You ever heard a tiger growl? It's very low and guttural. Produces terror in his victims or on their prey, forcing them out of their cover. A lion will roar a low roar and it can be carried for miles throughout the, the forest. And that's a sign to everything that's within hearing distance that there's a lion here and this area belongs to him and you better not let him see you or he'll kill you. And I believe, and you write this down somewhere, you, you remember that I said this, I believe devils can do that to us. I do. You say, well, I'm saved. Doesn't matter. I believe devils can growl and make you afraid literally of nothing. But I will tell you this, it would be a sure sign that they're there in the room. Wouldn't it? It would be, you would be, uh, they're here. I have experienced it. I have felt it. Almost to the point of just being out of my mind. My wife has seen it in me. And I've also, when God was ready to drive them away, I could immediately feel that they were gone. I can't see them, can't hear them, can't smell them. But all of a sudden, just like that, they're gone. I'm, I'm watching you guys. You guys are nodding your heads. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You've experienced it. You've seen it. Now you know what it is. It's some devils growling to make you afraid. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now think about that for a minute. What I just read was, the low growl of the tiger produces terror in his victims or their prey, forcing them out of their cover. So let me ask you this, what is our cover? We're in the sheepfold, aren't we? We're in the sheepfold. 
And the shepherd is guarding us in the sheepfold. And we are be covered and protected by him. Are we not? See, I wrote down here, fight or flight. The body has a response. It's called fight or flight. If, let's say, um, let's say something happens and you fall and you break your arm, you don't feel the pain immediately. The body reacts to that by flushing you with something similar to morphine, endorphins. So that for the first few minutes, you don't feel any pain. That is the body's way of giving you enough time to either kill what's killing you or run away. Sterling tells this joke. He's only got three jokes, but he tells this one. These are the two boys, and they, they come up some bigger boy, and the bigger boy was going to beat them. And the two boys started running off. Well, the big boy caught the one boy, beat him up. And when he finally caught up with the other boy, the little boy said, Man, I ran as fast as I could, and I couldn't get away with him. The other boy said, I didn't run as fast as I could. I ran as fast as I had to. You laugh at that. That's only, it's only, he's only got three jokes. Laugh at that one. It's called fight or flight. It will, it will give you the ability to either stand up and run or fight what's trying to kill you. And that's how your body reacts to it. When the devil comes after you, what he's trying to do, he knows that you're hidden. Turn to Psalm 91. You are hiding in Christ. God is protecting you. He knows... And I want you guys to listen to this. He knows that he can't get you while you are being covered by God. Somebody say amen. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. So, here you are now. You're in church. You're on your knees. You're reading your Bible. God has you protected. You are in the sheepfold of Jesus Christ. And as long as He's standing there and you're in the sheepfold, no enemy can come against you. Somebody say amen. The devil knows that. So guess what his next move is? If I can't get in there to them, I will get them to come out to me. Are you catching what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, he makes you afraid. Afraid that everybody in church will know you're a sinner. Afraid that you had just kind of fell into some temptation and you're afraid people's going to find out about it. That's why that preacher that I told you about, who when he found out the FBI was investigating him for molesting all these boys, went out into a field and blew his brains out. He was afraid that his church was going to find out what had happened. And he didn't want to face it. See, the devil chased him out of the sheepfold. And once he got him out there, he just devoured him. You young people, you're living in the sheepfold now. Your mom and daddy's protecting you. They're keeping the bad guys away from you. They're trying to keep the bad influences out of your life. They're trying to keep you away from certain people to protect you. What's the devil going to do? Lure you out. 
Why? So he can destroy you because he can't do it while you're under mom and daddy's protection, can he? Wives, husbands. The devil will try to get to the husbands to lure them out because he's standing there protecting his family. And once he's out, the devils move in on the family and destroy them. Am I right? How many, how many single mom families are living in Jefferson County right now? Way too many. It's because the devil lured the man out. So now the wife and child have no protection. And the devil just... <laughs> Destroys them. It's best to stay in the sheepfold. Somebody say amen. Now, notice this in your Bible. If you don't think I'm telling you the truth. I believe devils roar and can make us afraid. I know it. I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I've had it happen. I know it. Notice this, Psalm 65, 7, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. Psalm 89, 9, thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Psalm 93, 3, the floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their waves. Jonah, chapter 2, for thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and thy floods come past me about. All thy billows and all thy waves passed over me. See those waves. Those are low frequencies. Those are things the devil hits us with, Roy, to make us afraid. And if the devil makes you afraid by saying, hey, you're just one step away from getting drunk, you might just say, well, I might as well just go get drunk. See, he'll tell you that's how he thinks. That's how his mind works. The best thing he knows to do is to try to stop that by going to God and getting in the Word and say, God, help me. Because I'm this close to going out and getting drunk. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Of course he does. And he's the one that can make the waves stop. Somebody say amen. Jude one thirteen, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. This is possibly how devils, I believe probably, how devils invoke fear and anxiety in a believer's life to cause them to flee when none pursue. But I'm telling you, if you stay inside... The sheepfold. Stay under the protection of God's grace and God's authority. Stay under His tent, under His wings. Nothing can touch you. Nothing can. And what that takes is we're back now to that shield of faith if you will trust your God that he will protect you you do have nothing to worry about do you believe that do you trust him I hope you do let's bow our heads Father, these people, each one of us, Father, have our fears. I know what I'm afraid of. I know what I fear. I know what worries me. I know how the devil gets a hold of me. I know sometimes, God, that all of a sudden he just shows up there for no reason at all. And while I'm afraid, I can't. I can't speak, I can't preach, I can't teach. I just sit there and worry 
worry, worry. And Father, I thank you, God, that you've been there for me every single time. You've helped me. You've covered me. Father, things that I ran from for years, Father, you've taught me, Father, they weren't chasing me to begin with. I ran when nobody pursued me. I would have run out of the home. I would have run out of this church. I would have run out of the ministry. I would have run out of Kenya. Had you not helped me. Used my wife to help me. Used this church and these people to help me. To help me stay where I needed to stay. And to keep doing what I need to do. And Father, I know God, the devil will use my family, my daughters, my sons, my grandchildren. He'll try to use every one of them. Threatening to destroy them. Threatening to take them down. Threatening to ruin their lives. To the point, God, where I've told them, maybe they need to go on. Maybe they need to get away from Daddy. So the devil won't hurt them no more. Father, I'm glad they stuck. And I'm glad that I still have them. But Father, they're yours. And Lord, as long as you take them, I'll never have a problem with it. I'll never be angry with you. Because I know that they're going to be in your care. So Father, help us to not be afraid. Or teach us, Father, that what time we are afraid, we can always count on you. Father, we thank you for not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Father, when Michael gets on that plane, I pray, dear God, that you would give him perfect peace. And that, Father, Lord, you would bless the work that he does. It's important work. People's lives are counting on this. Their souls are counting on us. So, Father, would you give him perfect peace? We know, Father, that what the devil's tried to do to him. Just about every time he's gone to Kenya. I pray, dear God, Father, that you would just give him peace in his heart. Keep him safe. Bring him back here. But, Father, Lord, use the work that he does to further your kingdom and your glory's sake and your name's sake. If, Father, one soul in Kenya is saved, if one family is fed, Lord, it'll be worth it. And each one of us, Father, as we go about bearing our cross, help us, dear Father, to walk by our faith and not the dangers that we see, we see or pretend to see around us. Help us, Father, to lean not to our own understanding. But in all our ways, acknowledge you so you will direct our paths. You said you would keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Father, help us to have a mind that trusts you all the way to the lion's den. We trust you. Protect us like you did Noah. Protect us like you did Lot. Protect us like you did David. Protect us like you did Daniel. Protect us like you did Paul from the shipwreck. Protect us until the day you call us home, Father. And help us to never be afraid anymore. But to only trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.